SPS TV will begin broadcasting. For those joining by phone, please remain muted until we reach the testimony period and your name is called. Do we, Ellie or Julia, do you know, are we expecting a person to be here? No, okay. All right, uh, this is President Rankin. I am calling the July 2nd, 2024 regular board meeting to order at 4.21 p.m. This meeting is being recorded. We would like to acknowledge that we are on ancestral lands and traditional territories of the Puget Sound Coast Salish people. Ms. Wilson-Jones, the roll call, please. Director Briggs. Director Hersey. Here. Director Mizrahi. Present. Vice President Sarju. Present. Director Top. Here. President Rankin. Here. And it looks like Director Clark has not yet joined us. Um, the superintendent is not joining us today, uh, but we have a designee over there, not up here, but in the room. <laughs> that, you know, you're welcome to join us up here, but you're certainly not required to be up here. All right, all right. <laughs> um, that's out of, out of elbow distance, so that's a good choice. Um, let's see. Okay. So board comments section of the agenda. I have a few things um, a planning update, a little quick federal update, and um, then a quick overview uh, a WASDA update, um, which give me one second because I oh no, it's right here. Um, Director Clark is going to be joining us at 4:30. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, all right, so we have a relatively brief agenda, but one of the biggest legally required items, which is the budget. Um, so, uh, but if, yeah, a few things to discuss. Well, the last meeting, we voted to approve dates for the regular board meetings for the 24-25 school year, and um, we will be, you know, doing more work than is appearing on there. Um, we have uh, our goal and guardrail setting process is going on still, and leading up to the regular board meeting, we need to keep on that um, set of work, and we need to set a work plan for at least the fall, if not into next year, um, for. Uh, other meetings and other work that we want to that we want to take on. Um, so we need to have. I had proposed two board retreats: one for goal and guardrail drafting, and then a kind of regular, or, or not, I won't say regular because that's a regular board meeting, but like a, a, a typical start of the school year board retreat. Um, so you should have, if you haven't um, responded yet. There's a doodle poll. We do need to have two meetings. There was one doodle poll. It may have been a little bit confusing. There's a set of July dates and a set of August dates. Those are actually intended to be for two different meetings. So we need to have um, the retreat that we weren't able to have this on Sunday um, to do goal and guardrail drafting. 
and then um, we need to have a August retreat, which um, my initial proposal for that would be to have a full board governance training of some kind, um, either progress monitoring or time use or a general training. We can maybe send a poll of what, what folks would, be, would think would be most helpful now. You know, we have a lot of new board directors who had to get dropped in, in a pretty intense time. So um, an opportunity for board training and then a look at the um, remaining work on the implementation timeline for student outcomes focused governance framework and uh, uh, calendaring out what we want to what we want to do for the rest of the fall um, in between regular the regular board meetings. Um, so let's see. Well, we, we'll talk about more of these things in the August retreat. Should we be able to schedule one? But do, is there anything else that anybody um, wants to flag or feels important to, to address at that August retreat? Governance training. Implementi implementation timeline fall work plan. No. Okay. OK, cool. I will proceed with the assumption that that will be about what we're covering. Um, and so the other is that it doesn't have to be July and August, but I do think that we need to have two. We could do, a, a, you know, we could even do a Wednesday from three to eight or something like that. And um, as a retreat at, at the regular board time, if that works for people's schedules. So the board office will continue to try to provide options that, that we can hopefully <laughs> get scheduled soon, because I know um, everybody's really busy and the sooner the, sooner the better. Uh, but um, is there, any questions about the desire to have those two? Typically, we wouldn't want to have retreats so close together, but we do have these kind of important yeah. things to set. Um, does anybody have any questions or feedback about that? All right, cool. I will proceed in uh, working with the board office on scheduling. Um, where did my talking points go? OK. Oh, OK, federal. Legislative update. Um, it's not good. It's not good. Um, there's there's a there's a lot happening at the federal level um, with a presidential election and a bunch of decisions that came out of the Supreme Court in the last couple of weeks that. It's easy to think that that feels really far away, but they have dramatic, can have dramatic and immediate impacts for our students and for public schools. So um, the federal fiscal year 2025 is what provides school funding for the school year 25-26. So we're not talking about right this fall. We're talking about for the, what they're making decisions on right now at that level is for the 25-26 school year. Um, the uh, House Republicans last year, if you remember me talking about this, proposed uh, an 80% reduction to Title I funds and proposed cutting Title II and Title IV completely. That didn't pass. They're back this year. And they have passed a proposal from just the House. This is, again, at the federal level, um, uh, proposing a 20% um, cut to Title I this year. <laughs> and still reducing Title II and Title IV, which have uh, to do with language access for students. So these are all um, federal grants that school districts apply for and receive that we that directly provide services and support to our students. So um, uh, reductions in these fundings, these funding um, allocations would have a really significant impact on our budget and our ability to serve students. So. Um, let's see, how do I say this without directing advocacy? I guess I'm just saying, for, for your information, um, members of the House are, are the ones considering these things right now before it goes to appropriations. Um, 
um, uh, the Appropriations Committee at the federal level will be reviewing the budget um, uh, next week. So the proposals so far are not as bad as last year, and last year a lot of them didn't pass, but it still um, would be pretty dramatically terrible for Seattle Public Schools and public schools across the country. Um, so continue to watch that. Um, there's a, been a lot of activity in the Supreme Court <laughs> in the last month. Um, one of the more significant things was an overturn of the Chevron Doctrine. The Chevron Doctrine was passed, I think, in the 70s and um, basically states that if legislation isn't super clear and prescriptive, that the, the federal government trusts the, the closest expert agency to make further decisions on legislation. So like if it's a, it was actually about environmental, um, it was about air pollution when it first passed, that if the federal legislation wasn't um, directive enough that the EPA as the expert body in the area would would basically be delegated figuring out implementation. So the overturn of that means that the um, assumption of reasonableness for expert departments is gone, and that 800 and something federal circuit court judges, um, basically that expert departments are no longer looked to as the experts, that um, uh, court rulings decides everything. So um, that is potentially very scary, meaning that if there is legislation about the provision of education that is not detailed enough, that the Department of Education would no longer be entrusted to um, fleshing out that implementation, it would be up to courts to dictate um, and provide direction. So. Um, yeah, more to come on that, I'm sure, because that is something that just happened, and the ways in which that may play out are are unknown, but that is something that is looming over um, all public school districts. Um, a positive thing federally is that the gun violence epidemic has been officially declared a public health emergency at the federal level by the Surgeon General. Um, this is really significant because it means that instead of being a conversation about, um, you know, like th think about um, anti-smoking campaigns. Once that was declared a public health crisis and the surgeon, you know, all the cigarette boxes have Surgeon General warnings and there's limitations about advertising and all that kind of thing, that can only happen once it becomes a public health issue. And, and so it is um, a step in a positive direction that the acknowledgement that the leading cause of death of children is by firearm is being addressed as the public health crisis that it actually is. Um, so, yeah, okay, so that was the federal. N nothing super concrete, but also just a lot that of things that are sort of maybe don't feel as pressing or immediate as something like um, school consolidation, but is has the potential to have a disastrous impact on our students and our school district. So we will continue to be watching and advocating for um, serving students. Ay, ay, ay. Um, all right, WASDA. So um, we just had a WASDA board meeting last week to review two proposals for um, bylaws changes. To WASDA, we, we, the board of directors for WASDA recommended a do not pass on those. One of them was about um, student representation. It was actually a really great proposal, but it didn't, the, having it be a bylaws change um, wasn't quite the right, right avenue for it. So I have actually offered to support the sponsors in it and making a 
policy proposal to WASDA um, instead of as a bylaw because it was recommended do not pass. And um, that was, so we already have a student representative network across the state um, of districts that have student board representatives. They're part of this network supported by WASDA, which is the Washington State School Director Association. Sorry for <laughs> missing that acronym. Um, this- Can I pause you just a second? Yeah. I'm getting an onslaught of emails that we are not, they cannot hear us on the broadcast. Oh. And when I say onslaught, I mean like five emails, so not very many. I mean, that's a lot of emails to get during a meeting. <laughs> Um, let's see. Okay, I'll hold for a second. Sorry. No, no, that's okay. We do indeed need to take a quick recess to address a technical issue. Okay, and now if I announce that, <laughs> people can't hear, are they gonna hear that? <laughs> Um, maybe it'll show up in the captioning. Um, we are having a technical issue with sound, and we'll be taking a brief recess to get that addressed. And we'll back. We will be back with you shortly. It is 4.40, we are um, coming, what, what are, unrecessing? What is, we're back, we're back in order. 
Uh, assuming Ellie, we're good, you can hear? All right, sweet. Thank you everyone for your patience. We had a technical issue for folks online and um, that should um, be solved. That should be solved. Um, oh, WASDA, okay. So we are, it feels like legislative session just ended, but we're a state legislative session, but we're getting ready for the next one. And so one of, an important step in that is that um, WASDA members who are all school board directors in the state have the opportunity to submit with board approval um, position proposals. And this guides WASDA's advocacy. It's very similar to um, PTA or any other membership driven organization where members provide um, members provide the uh, proposals and a vote of membership or a representative vote of membership is what determines what becomes the positions of the body. So this is one of the most consistent ways that our, um, we contribute to advocacy in Olympia together with other boards from the whole state um, is in this positions catalog that authorizes the um, our staff and WASDA and all WASDA members to say, on behalf of WASDA, et cetera, et cetera, um, based, on a, based on the passage of positions. So the catalog, if you didn't get an email that the catalog is online, um, the catalog is online, um, which has the all the proposed positions that have come from um, boards around the state and you can read all of those and then there is an um, amendment window that lasts for a month where you can submit um, suggested amendments. So I'm flagging this for you all because Director Top and I, uh, me as the legislative liaison and um, Gina as an alternate and, and hopefully future legislative liaison, um, will <laughs> we'll, uh, go to General Assembly where Delegates from every school board come together. Every board gets a voting delegate, and we vote on the positions that we'll take as a as a body for advocacy across the state. So um, we will be going and voting on positions on our behalf in September. But before that, the draft catalog is out now. If you all read it, and if there's something, if there's an amendment that you would like our board to propose, um, we, we would have to vote on it as a board, and the amendment window closes before our next scheduled board meeting, but we could call, I could call um, and schedule a special meeting just to vote on positions if there were things that folks felt strongly about. Um, so take a look and let me know, and then also, prior to us going and actually being voting delegates for that, um, we will uh, you know, make sure that all board directors provide, that we have a conversation about what positions we wanna support and not like what we should vote on as, as your delegates. Um, so does anybody have any questions about that? Okay. Um, yeah, and then once, after General Assembly, once, once those positions are approved. Those become the new or amended positions of the body of Washington State School Directors, and that is used to guide advocacy on behalf of the entire organization um, at next, next legislative session um, that starts in January. We also will pass our own legislative platform, which we do every year for any Seattle-specific advocacy that directs, on behalf of the board, um, uh, directs staff and our lobbyist about positions that we want to support and, and things that we will advocate for as a district. So those two things are happening, but the, the, pro the longer process right now is for WASDA, so that positions catalog is out. So take a look if there's anything that you want to weigh in, us to weigh in on as a district for these state wide positions, let me know. Uh, 
All right. Do we have any other liaison reports? All right. Um, uh, I have actually one more thing about engagement. So we have we had planned to finish our our engagement on goals and guardrails in time for the retreat, but since we're rescheduling it, we have a little bit more time. <laughs> there are a couple. We we've done 28, I think, including the three public ones. Um, there are. Um, like three or four more groups that I think it would be really valuable for us to engage with. Um, if that, do folks have capacity to do one more in pairs engagement, one or two more sometime in the month of July, if I were to reach out? I can do one more. It'd be like an hour and a half, you know, like the. I could do one more in July. Yeah, it wholly depends on the timing. So I would say schedule it and let us know. Okay. Um, and we'll go from there. And I don't. I don't I've got availability, President okay. Rankin. Awesome. Thank you, Director Clark. Okay. So I will um, check in with a couple folks that we sort of had as, you know, not quite scheduled yet and see if we can get them scheduled. That would be great. Like, uh, President Rankin, I have one uh, comment or one board comment. Uh, I have my District 6. A monthly public meeting on July 17th at 6 p.m. This one will be online. It's a Wednesday. So uh, it will be on the district webpage. All right. I don't see any hands up online. So we can um, now go to public testimony. Um, board procedure 1430 BP provides the rules for testimony and I ask that speakers are respectful of these rules. I will summarize some important parts of this procedure. First testimony will be taken today from those individuals called from our public testimony list and if applicable the waiting list which are included on today's agenda posting on the school board website. Only those who are called by name should unmute their phones or step forward to the podium and only one person should speak at a time. Listed speakers may cede their time to another person when the listed speaker's name is called. The total amount of time allowed will not exceed two minutes for the combined number of speakers. Time will not be restarted after the new speaker begins and the new speaker will not be called again later if they are on the testimony or waiting list. The majority of the speaker's time should be spent on the topic they have indicated they wish to speak about when signing up. And lastly, the board expects the same standard of civility for those participating in public comment as the board expects of itself. As board president, I have the right to and will interrupt speakers who fail to observe the standard of civility required by board procedure 1430BP. Um, a speaker who refuses or fails to comply with these guidelines or who otherwise substantially disrupts the orderly operation of this meeting may be asked to leave. Um, staff may read off the, will read off the testimony speakers. Thank you. Good afternoon um, for today's speakers. Please, when you, um, I'm a, I'll call you by name, and when you do step to the podium or unmute on the conference call line by pressing star six, please feel free to reintroduce yourself as I am not gonna get all the name pronunciations correct. The first speaker today is Chris Jackins. My name is Chris Jackins, Box 84063, Seattle 98124, on the minutes of the July 26th board meeting and on board policy 3520 on student fees. Four points, number one, the minutes omit any mention of the board discussion on student fees for athletics participation. The discussion should be preserved in the minutes. Number two, the discussion made mention of an anonymous donor who had previously covered these costs the district should never have agreed to keep the donor secret. Number three, the public has a right to know 
who is promoting district taxpayer funded expenditures, which may benefit the donor. Number four, please publicly mention the identity of the donor today. On the 24-25 budget, please amend the budget two points. Number one, please increase the size of both the interfund loan and the general fund use of capital fund interest. Number two, please ask the city to repurpose existing city levy funds to keep schools open and to retain staff. On the proposed principals association three-year contract, two points. Number one, the board previously approved a teacher's SEA contract when it did not know how it would pay for years two and three. Number two, perhaps the principals association contract should be for one year. On school closures, two points. Number one, I have visited many targeted schools and I have provided the district with dozens of signed statements by parents and others opposing school closures. Number two, the board should vote to stop the school closure process. Please do not close schools. Thanks very much. The next speaker is Manuela Sly. After Manuela will be Janice White and then Becky Brownlee. Good afternoon. My name is Manuela Sly. I'm a proud parent of three graduates from West Seattle High School, and I serve as a Student Safety Committee Chair for Seattle Council PTSA. I'm here to ask the school board to pass the amendment to board policy 3240, student behavior and, and disciplinary responses. It is critical that students have access to know and understand their rights and responsibilities. This amendment will ensure school buildings do right by our students and their families, creating a clear pathway for a student voice and for the um, for student voice and for the district superintendent to uh, adopt procedures for students to have access to materials and understand their rights. At the moment, there are handbooks and flyers with information, but not a clear pathway to access them. The handbook is 49 pages long, and very few people know it exists or where to find it. At buildings, all buildings should have a document that works for the community based on the existing policy and handbook, a document school administrators can look at together with the students and center their voices. To truly have self and welcoming environments at schools, students must know their rights, including special education protections and how to report incidents of sexual harassment, bullying, and racism. In terms of disciplinary action, it is critical students and families are aware of that there are specific guidelines for suspensions and expulsions that they also have the right to have the notice of disciplinary action within 24 hours of an incident in their home language, and that they have the right to appeal any disciplinary decision within five days of being notified. Right now, many students and their families go through unnecessary heartache, not knowing their rights, and that is unacceptable. Please vote yes on the amendment of board policy 3240. Thank you. The next speaker is Janice White. Janice, um, you'll need to press star six to unmute on the conference line. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. My name is Janice White. I'm the parent of three SPS graduates and also a past president of Seattle Special Education PTSA. Last week, Dr. Torres spoke about inclusion in a well-resourced school. Respectfully, what was missing from his presentation was any definition of what the district means when it talks about inclusion. Right now, the district assigns students who receive special education services to service pathways. Some of those service pathways, like focus and distinct, mean that those students receive all or most of their instruction and services in separate classrooms, segregated from their general education peers. Does the district envision changing that in a system of inclusive, well-resourced schools? In other service pathways, like resource and extended access, students are often pulled out of the general education classroom to receive services. Does the district envision changing that in a system of inclusive, well-resourced schools? I'm involved in starting a new nonprofit organization, All Youth Belong. Our mission is to counter the exclusion of disabled youth 
and disrupt the attitudes and practices that limit their full participation in community life. Last month, we held a community conversation about inclusive schools with several schools in the Northwest region, including Loyal Heights, Adams, Lichten Springs, Magnolia, West Woodland, and Hazel Wolf. We talked about what inclusion looks like right now at each school, what other inclusive practices folks would like to see in their schools, and what the barriers are to implementing inclusion. Representatives from our partner, the UW Herring Center for Inclusive Education, presented and led the conversation. We had principals, teachers, school staff, and families sitting together with local experts on inclusive education and discussing these issues. The desire, the interest, the motivation to do better for our students is there, but it takes a lot of work to change a school culture, and it has to include all members of our school community. We hope to sponsor similar conversations in other parts of the city in the fall. We can't break down the barriers to inclusion without working together. We look forward to the district defining what inclusion looks like and how it will be implemented in well-resourced schools. Thank you. The next speaker is Becky Brownlee. Hello, I'm Becky Brownlee. I'm a parent at Lafayette Elementary. As we're going through um, massive changes due to the budget crisis we face, I'd like to remind everyone of the Kubler-Ross change management curve. Everyone moves through the same curve, and the greater, more disruptive the change, the longer it takes to get to the other side. You guys all have the luxury of being further along the curve, but most of us, parents, um, and probably staff, are still very near the beginning. I've helped brainstorm well-resourced schools, I've attended the community meetings, and I've tried to be patient meeting after meeting when we thought the school closure list would be announced only to be disappointed with no decision. Until you announce the list of schools that will be closed, most of us remain in the shocked and denial phase. Therefore, you aren't hearing much other than don't close any schools. And more importantly, we aren't able to start the work needed to help our students manage through this change curve. As you take more time to either decide or to figure out the PR of announcing the school closures, you're robbing the students of the valuable time that they need to manage one of the biggest changes in their childhoods. Publish the list and announce everything, school closures, new boundary lines. Don't just say, these are the schools that are closing and we'll come back with more information in six months. Expect that people are early in this change curve. Listen, engage, support. Don't expect everything to be, everybody to be all the way through the curve like you might be. You've seen the impact a motivated parent community can make Let's support, just we would really love your support in making this transition easier. The only way we can do that is if we're let in on the decision early and fully. Don't make us scramble. Thank you guys so much for your time. The final speaker is Hem Nalini Morizari Luna. And if you're on um, the phone, you may need to press star six now to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, my name is Nalini Morsaria Luna. Uh, my children attended John Stanford International School for Elementary, and I am a former PCSA president. I am also a scientist, and as such, I know the power of data. I know how it can be manipulated and tailored to fit specific narratives. At the June 26 board meeting, the district staff presented data on building condition, capacity, enrollment, and learning experience, which they stated would be used to decide which schools to close. This data tells a story about John Stanford. The narrative is that John Stanford should be on the list of schools to close. It has a capacity of 398 students, which is below the threshold of 400 for a well-resourced school. It has a building that is not in the best condition and a low score for learning environment. However, 
enrollment at the school has been above 400 students every year since 2011. And the 2021 facilities master plan, which is supposed to be the planning document through 2026, including for the capital levy that will go to voters next year, says that the right size capacity at John Stanford is 488 students and its operational capacity is 437. In fact, 70% of the schools that are listed in the June 26 data have a capacity that is suddenly much lower or higher than what is listed in the facilities master plan, including 11 schools with up to less than 40% lower capacity than the facilities master plan number. There are also discrepancies in the building condition rankings, and I cannot comment on the learning environment scores because they are not available to the public. To generate trust in the process of selecting schools for closure, this district needs to make all data available and explain why this data differs from other planning documents. Thank you. That was the final speaker on today's testimony list. All right, thank you. We have now reached the consent portion of today's agenda. May I have a motion for the consent agenda? Evan, will you, since uh, Director Director Sarge is remote, if you would, if you would motion? Yeah, I'm 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 here, but I don't have the. Yeah, that's okay. Director the notes can, in front uh, of me. Oh, we got you. Thank you. Okay, I move approval of wait of the consent agenda, right? Okay. Second. Uh, approval of the consent agenda has been moved by Director Briggs and seconded by Director Top. Do directors have any items they would like to remove from consent? Seeing none, all those in favor of the consent agenda. Oh. <laughs> Something it just got very quiet. Yeah. Uh, all those in favor of the um, consent agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, the Aye. Oh. <laughs> All right, the consent agenda has passed unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we will now move to action items, of which we have one action item. Um, resolution 2023-24-9, fixing and adopting the 2024-25 budget. May I have a motion for this item? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, I'm just going to riff here. <laughs> <laughs> ah, great, okay. Okay, I move that the school board adopt resolution 2023-24-9 as attached to the board action report to fix and adopt the 2024-25 budget, the four-year budget plan summary, and the four-year enrollment projections. Second. Um, this item has been moved by Director Briggs and seconded by Director Topp. Do we have, I mean, I'm assuming we don't have a presentation unless there's anybody with a burning last minute question. Um, speaking of which, does anybody have any questions or comments on this item? No. All right. Um, uh, roll call, please. Director Clark. Yay. Director Hersey. Aye. Director Mizrahi. Aye. Vice President Sarju. Aye. Director Top. Aye. Director Briggs. Aye. President Rankin. Aye. This motion is passed unanimously. All right. Thank you. Um, we will now move to introduction items. Uh, this is the amendment to board policy number 3240, student behavior and disciplinary responses and repeal of board policy 3200, written rules of student conduct. 
I see we have Dr. Torres approaching the podium. And whenever you are ready, please go ahead. Good evening, board directors. This motion would amend board policy number 3240, student behavior and disciplinary responses. And this motion is to align it with the Washington State School Directors Association and or WASDA model policy. It would also repeal board policy number 3200, the written rules of student conduct, as it is functionally incorporated into the amended board policy number 3240. Under board policy 3200, written rules of student conduct, the board has annually approved the basic rules of Seattle Public Schools document that includes the legally required student responsibilities and student rights, including due process. In July of 2023, the board directed the superintendent to make the necessary policy changes to align the board's process with state law, which requires board approval, but not annually. The attached revisions to board policy number 3240 align with the WASDA model policy as required by the WAC. And the revised policy also incorporates por portions of the current board policy number 3200. Board approval, such board approval gave direction to the super superintendent regarding communication of the basic rules of Seattle Public Schools and school level handbook development. During last year's approval process, the board also directed the superintendent to expand the means through which the basic rules of Seattle Public Schools are communicated in student and family accessible ways. Updates and trainings are made available to school leaders each year on the basic rules of Seattle Public Schools and are slated to occur again during School Leader Institute in August of 2024. Of note would be the issue of access and participation in development. Additionally, within the bar itself is a list of a charted list of some of the activities that already have occurred and those that are still due to occur. Open to any questions from board directors, please. Thank you very much. This is um, uh, an item that has been talked about on a pretty frequent basis. And last year we had a work session, as Dr. Torres noted, um, we identified the, the priorities for, for what we want to see on this so that students do have access. And just thank you to staff for being responsive and, and centering those needs and working with us through that. Um, I have one question, which forgive me, I should probably know this, but the law that requires meaningful participation um, for parents in IEP meetings, including language access, and any accommodations for disability, would that, is there anything similar? Does that also apply to disciplinary hearings or conversations about discipline for families? When it comes to students with disabilities, pretty much um, when you have those discipline, disciplinary hearings, protections that are granted to a student via I, the IDEA or generally extend to those meetings as well. So for example, we do know that once a student with disabilities hits 10 days of having to be out for sort of a disciplinary infraction, you have to, you have to conduct a team meeting at that point. So in general, when a student has a disability or qualifies for services, their protections are extended to them through the process as well. So let's say I was your student and manifestation of my disability is such that I engage in certain behaviors. If that is what is documented as part of my disability, I necessarily cannot be disciplined for those things. It would need to be programmatic services provided to me by the district in order to help me with those, you know, my activities or whatever I'm doing. Um, what about parent? I'm, I was mainly meaning to ask about parent access. So, you know, providing interpretive interpretation services for families is required to have meaningful participation in an IEP meeting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about in a disciplinary meeting for a student with or without disabilities? Do we, are there similar protections or requirements that families have access in their primary language to I those, to that process? I would need to clarify. I'll need to okay. do the research, but I'll find out and I'll give a response to the whole board. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on this item? All right. Seeing none. Thank you. Dang. 
I'm <laughs> sort of like, are we really at this point in the agenda? <laughs> Nobody tell me if we're not. Um, uh, okay, self-evaluation. So that takes care of our business items. Now we have our quarterly self-evaluation, um, which we engaged in for a baseline during a meeting in, I think, April. Um, so the posted materials include the governance manual as well as our, oh, our last quarterly evaluation, which we complete on April 25th. And um, unless anybody has um, a different interpretation, I did not see us as having um, had any change between then and now. Um, and that's not a criticism, that's just a, you know, we, we actually talked about what do we want to focus on first and we didn't get to it. We've been doing a lot of engagement, which is, which is great. So, however, if anybody feels differently about um, my sort of, uh, basically the scores that you see here for the current quarter, April through June, are the same as the ones that we did together in April. Um, I looked at the rubric and I didn't see any, any reason to, to change any of them. Um, so, uh, so I put that in here in the, the sheet that is in the meeting materials and that directors have in front of them. Um, the score for this quarter, April through June, and um, green is meeting, yellow is approaching, red is not. <laughs> or d does not meet. Um, so that was, th these are the scores based on our, our self-assessment. And then I, um, in looking at the scoring tool, I forecasted out what I, if you look at um, moving from, you know, not student outcomes focused, approaching, meeting, and mastering, I forecasted out what I believe to be um, reasonable progress to be made <laughs> um, with notes underneath about uh, steps we can take to make that progress. And so um, what I would like us to talk about now is um, any questions that folks may have about or if you think some of these are not reasonable or um, questions about the recommendations for how we move, uh, how we make progress. Um, let's talk about it. <laughs> I guess we could go, we could go, um, should we go a, a section at a time through the six sections? Okay, so we currently are um, meeting student outcomes focused for vision and goals. Our goals all pertain to desired student outcomes. Um, we have annual targets for goal ending points for each year. And the superintendent has provided interim goal ending points for each year. Our interim goals pertain to student outputs or outcomes, not inputs or adult outputs, check. Um, the board included students, parents, staff, and community members in the goal development process, and we are in the process of doing that now again. Um, board goals last in three to five years. Goals and interim goals will challenge the organization and will require change in adult behaviors. I think we have yet to you know, make progress on the changing of behaviors, but we do have goals and interim goals that to be met do require behavior change. So my, so I, we scored ourselves in April as, as being at meeting. Um, to move to mastering, um, what we need to do is rely on a root cause analysis, comprehensive student needs assessment, and or similar research-based tool to inform identification of and prioritization of potential goals. Um, I sent you all an email earlier. Um, about this, we, uh, I would, I think this is one is not only doable, but highly necessary um, as we're developing our 
goals and guardrails for the 2025-30 year that we have not only our, uh, excuse me, uh, community voice for the priorities, but that we also have a very good understanding of where things are at, even, even, even if they're not necessarily being monitored in the current goals and guardrails. Um, the reason for that is uh, so that as we are setting our goals, we can maximize, uh, maximize effort, basically, on areas of highest need. And so we could set goals based on priorities that are just sort of what do people think are the most important and here's how we can make progress, but we, we need to balance that with um, the reality of where students are and focus our goals on the areas that can have the greatest impact. Um, so, uh, to my knowledge, this kind of root cause analysis student data evaluation has not, I have not seen it be produced in my decade of um, being an advocate and board member of Seattle Public Schools of just a, let's talk about where we're at for which students. Um, and so uh, this is um, gonna be a really powerful piece to our goal setting and I, as part of our engagement process, um, our goals and guardrail process that we're doing right now, we have already, we have already requested, or you know, I'm working with the board office on um, providing us internal data that we may have to look at while we draft, while we do our initial drafting um, at a retreat. But prior to the adoption, the final version, I think we need to see an outside um, entity just do a. Um, a student need analysis for us. So if, um, and, and that would, uh, you know, move us in the metric, which is great, but more importantly, allow us to better serve students. C couple quick questions. Um, how long will such an analysis take to complete, do we know? Um, I think, honestly, I don't think it takes more than like five or six weeks. Okay. Um, and then what, when, when it says root cause analysis, what root cause of what exactly is that um, referring to? Uh, opportunity gaps and achievement gaps. Okay. Like if you look at, you know, uh, third grade reading, as all students, you look at it as broken down to different demographics, root cause analysis would be what's happening with this group instead of just like, oh, we'll just teach them harder, you know? So, <laughs> you so basically like anything that is, that we already currently know is like a deficit. We're looking for the root cause of, so it could be any number of things. It could be any number of things and ultimately what we're really looking for is what is within the power of the superintendent to influence. Mm -hmm. So if we know that housing insecurity is a root cause of, of um, you know, uh, frequent absences, for example. Um, we don't expect the superintendent to provide all children with housing, but we do expect that looking at the root cause, that in order to improve, you know, housing insecure students grade level three reading that the strategies recommended would uh, would come with the recognition that the the root cause is actually housing instability mm. and and how what supports are needed that we can provide at school to um offset to yeah. offset yeah. that okay. and, and help that student basically how do we make sure that um how do we identify what how do we identify achieving universal goals with um, differentiated strategies mm -hmm. by acknowledging the different challenges that different groups of students have and making sure that basically equitable support is provided um, so that all students can, can succeed. Got it, thanks. Any other questions on that one? 
So this that that one actually I um I think here, but I know Superintendent Jones is a part of those conver conversations, but I'm not authorized. I'm not delegated. It's not delegated to me as the president to say, "Hey, Superintendent Jones, we yes, we want you to do a root cause analysis." Um, so I would actually like to ask for a motion to direct to direct the superintendent to work with an outside entity to um, uh, to get the root cause analysis or comprehensive student needs assessment to inform the prioritization of our 25, 20, 30 goals. Um, and then, let's see, two parts. One part would be we need a uh, vote of the board is what will direct the superintendent. And then the second part would be um, to delegate me to affirm whatever entity the superintendent chooses or me and another director depending on what, what you all want to do. But basically we're directing, we're directing the superintendent to provide this report to us. Um, and so it would be, what my ask is for us to um, direct the superintendent to engage with a local university or educational data and research nonprofit to produce such an assessment and authorize me to um, work with the superintendent on confirming the entity that he wants to use. I have a question. This is Director Sarju. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. Um, I am curious how, um, well, I'm, I'm, I think my, what I'm really curious about is, A, are there entities out there that have done successfully done this type of thing before and when i say successfully meaning the report provided actually um helped to guide uh a response or implementation of recommendations or whatever it is that comes out of the report so do we do we know of entities that have successfully done it and then what would be the process for deciding which entity? Um, sorry, let me, I'm looking at my notes. Yeah, so like many, like Council Great City Schools does this. Um, uh, I would imagine Western Washington University probably does this. Other local entities would be able to do this. Um, and then what was the other question? The, the other question is how, what is the process for selection? I'm, I'm assuming it's not an RFP, um, but what, if it's not an RFP, then what is it? Um, we would be authorizing the superintendent to, uh, to determine what entity can best provide this. And then you as the president would approve of that or what's the process? I guess what I'm trying to get at is uh, I, I would like for this to be as objective as possible. Yes. Um, and so how that, <laughs> how that happens in real life will determine whether or not it's objective. Um, and so in my deliberation right here, as I'm talking with you, I would, I would think we would need more than just one recommendation we would need a couple so that there could be some study of qualification and previous success so i'm not articulating this exactly the way i wanted i want to if i had you know had a couple of days to think about it um or more time to think about it but that's what comes to mind right now Um, I think what I would say this is uh, not intended to be a um, like a vendor contract. It's it's I don't know how to explain it. There's multiple educational research firms that would be able to do this, and if we have requirements of them, we can certainly provide them. Um, we can also, if there is a cost, approve have the cost come back to us for approval. Um, but this is mainly. Uh, directing the superintendent to 
figure out for us who could do this because the board actually needs this report to do our work. How does this Thank so, you. That answers my question. If this is for our 25, 30 goals and we're trying to create our goals come August, mm -hmm. how, what, how's this timeline work? So we would have, for our retreat, we would have internal data provided. Okay. Which will give us should give us a, a, pr a pretty good understanding of where things are and then we would have this outside firm so that we would have basically validation and maybe more detail from an outside firm before we finalize the adoption so we would we could workshop again and and work to to, re to refine yeah finer goals so your thoughts are on the timeline are in august we have initial information and data from the district internally as we craft our new goals. And then an outside entity reviews our goals with the data or? No, this, they wouldn't be reviewing our goals. They would be strictly looking at student data, just an assessment of where are the gaps, how students are doing, um, like a deep dive into identifying the highest areas of need and potential impact and providing us that report regardless of what our goals are. And then we could look at that and go, okay, well, given that these are the community priorities and this is where we're headed in our drafts, let's tailor that a little bit more to point to this demonstrated higher need. We wouldn't be, you know, we wouldn't be saying, well, community priorities were this, but this says that, we'd still have to it's basically allowing us to, to take the two together for where do we want to go, the goals and guardrails are where do we want to go, and the student needs analysis would be and what's the reality for where students are right now. I understand that. I'm just trying to understand the timeline from when we create goals and when we sort of, when the intention is to finalize the goals along with the strategic plan in order so everything aligns properly. Where's the... So we would have the internal data for our retreat. And then when we come back, then, then it, we don't vote on it. We have the internal data for the retreat to, to get kind of our, our starting point. Then as part of our engagement process too, we want to share that back out with the community and say, hey, here's what we heard from you. Here's what we as a board have developed out of that. Like, let's get your feedback again. Did we, did we miss what you were saying? Did we get it? Then prior to, hopefully prior to introduction, but maybe prior to action, we would get this outside student needs analysis and be able to recalibrate. And in the meantime, the superintendent would also be working on interim measures, which I think would be, um, that having that student need data would be really important. And so we'd probably have a, um, at least two more conversations as a group with all of those things together to refine before we say, okay, yes, we're ready to adopt our goals and guardrails. Okay. Does that help? Yes, that, okay. thank you. Sorry. <laughs> as our public testimony speaker was saying, my Ooh. mind is ahead. Um, Oh, okay, I'm getting a note that I need to recess for a second. So, we'll be back in a few minutes. Why, why are we recessing? I've just, I've been given a note from staff that I need to recess for a minute. Okay. BRB.
everyone. Um, uh, sorry, that was a little bit confusing. <laughs> the uh, procedurally um, uh, adding a motion um, could have come at the beginning, well, it could come now, but could have come at the beginning of the meeting with a uh, motion to amend the agenda. Since we didn't do that and we're towards the end of our meeting, we don't need to make an action item. Um, but it sounds like we do have uh, alignment and understanding that this is work for the superintendent to carry out, results of which are important for us as a board to have to do our work. And as the delegate for Superintendent Jones today, can I ask um, Fred Podesta, um, do you have uh, sufficient understanding of what's being asked now to proceed with uh, for the superintendent to proceed with determining what partner or entity might be appropriate and um, uh, progressing with um, a student needs analysis, which of course, if there's a cost associated that is out of line with existing policy would need to come back to the board for approval. Thank you, President Rankin. Uh, Fred Podesta, Chief Operations Officer on behalf of Dr. Jones tonight. Um, yeah, I think we, uh, we will need to have continuing conversations with the board, but um, our understanding of the motion that you were starting to put together, I think, is well in alignment of the work that we already do. And certainly, staff and the superintendent share your interest um, in understanding um, uh, all the dimensions of student performance that you discussed. And so we'll. Uh, expedite this as best we can and work with the board. Great, thank you. Can I request that um, at a regular board meeting in August we get an update of uh, an identified entity if there is one and what, what the expectations and scope and timeline might be? Absolutely. Great, thank you. Anybody have any other questions on that? All right. I have a procedural question. What yes. what is happening now? Are we're not? I didn't hear a motion. We we don't need one. We are we are now back. We're just discussing our um, self evaluation, and that asking for um, it would have been better for me to have amended the agenda at the beginning of the meeting to add um add an action item. So because. Uh, we're towards the end of the meeting, we are not going to do that as an action item. Does that make sense? Yes. So we're moving on. Yep. Is that what you're saying? Yep. And we got okay. confirmation from the uh, substitute Dr. Jones that that will not delay, <laughs> that will not delay progress and is already aligned with um, work that the superintendent and staff have um, been doing in preparation for this next phase. All right, so apologies again for that confusion. Thank you for learning in public with me. All right, so presuming that we have that analysis, I, I estimate that our we could move into mastering student outcomes focused on vision and goals by the um, end of December because we will, we will have then relied on a root cause analysis, comprehensive student needs assessment to inform identification of and prioritization of our goals. Okay, cool. So the next one is values and guardrails, which we scored ourselves as approaching. Um, let me see. Oh, okay, so moving from approaching to meeting would take the adoption of a theory of action for the 2530 strategic plan developed in collaboration with the superintendent, which I believe we could do by the end of December as part of the, um, we will have finalized our goals and guardrails. And, um, well, actually, wait. What do you, what do you, what comments does directors have on this? Because theory of action we may not have until I think you're moving too fast on this one. Yeah, we may not have let's until. Try to let's try to focus our efforts. I really like focusing on the vision and goals. I think 
trying to get where you're, you want January, March is we're moving too fast. Okay. Yeah, and I'm realizing as we're saying it this out loud, the theory of action may be in development in October, December, but we cert we won't have adopted it yet because that would come with the superintendent's um, part of the strategic plan, which doesn't happen until later. Yeah. In agreement. Yeah. I have a statement. Um, I just wanted to pick up on the thread that Director Topp was laying down. It might be advantageous as we're going through here to identify like what is going to A, be possible, and B, yield the most bang for our buck, and like choose some focus areas, and then everything else we can pick back up when we review these again um, in the next quarter. Sounds good. Okay, so for values and guardrails, I'm, it sounds like we'll probably stay at a five until the end of March, right? Yeah, because that would that would probably be actually the earliest that we would have the theory of action. And probably not even until April or May. Okay, change that to five. Okay, monitoring and accountability. Um, we could move from approaching to meeting by the end of September with 25% of meeting time spent monitoring goals. Hang on. Um, No, we have ourselves at 10. We're at 10. Over at 10. And our goal is 20. Uh, no, 20, sorry, 20 is the score. Um, yeah, that's our goal. That's where you want to go. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. I was confusing 25%. Yeah. So um, do the closest we've gotten has been, I think, 20%. Um, yeah, I yeah, think I think stays. there's probably a lot of stuff that's going to take up airtime during meetings. Okay. Okay, so that's... Though, can I chime in quickly? I, I do feel like monitoring and accountability is one of the areas that I feel that we should focus on. Um, to, to Director Hersey's point about bang for the buck and so forth. However, I'm not entirely sure how when we only get data at a couple times of the year, then how, I mean, how does that work? I mean, because we're somewhat limited or constrained by, I mean, I, I guess our guardrail data, um, but right, I mean, we have like the fall academic data and the spring academic data. So is there, what are the other ways that we can, um, increase our ability to monitor? Uh, well, we could you reduce, decrease time yeah. spent on things that are not monitoring. Exactly. Which is why it would be hard to meet, because if anything, we're going to have to increase our time given the nature of what we're about to tackle mm. next year, you see? Yeah. Yeah. But it's a good question. I think we could look at some of the other things in the 20 and say we don't have to focus on just that 25%. The first one, the board invests no less than 25% of its total board authorized public meeting minutes monitoring schools, but we could, f because I think that will be extremely difficult to hit, but we could focus some of our time on some of the other areas in the meeting student outcomes focus category, no more than two goals are monitored per month. Every goal is monitored at least four times per year. Every guardrail is monitored at least once per year. I think all of these things, hopefully at our September retreat or our August retreat are set in a calendar so we see them laid out along with when our meetings are going to happen. Yeah. All that should be on the work plan. I yes. think that's great. Yeah. And we also, um, the because next year we'll be monitoring the current goals and guardrails. Right. We do have the opportunity and probably should make some adjustments if we think, um, you know, not, not anything major obviously because they're just for a year, but in thinking about this year of transition, if there are some things that we want to make adjustments to, um, we can do that for monitoring over the next year and, and uh, use that both as an opportunity to to make some 
meaningful things to monitor for the next year, but also to um, focus on getting this cadence of, of what Gina just read. I think that holds to Evan, or sorry, Director Briggs's portion of accountability. So we're trying to hit, hit the time metrics on our work plan for everything else, but understanding that we probably won't hit 20 because, 20 points, because we probably won't hit that first metric. Yeah, and the other thing that I would say is that it would be interesting to me, uh, because to monitor our goals does not require us to have data. Like, we could get better understandings of what are the tools being utilized. We could be taking a closer look at our interim goals um, and things like that. I think that that would be of use and value because when we get our progress monitoring, a lot of the questions that I've noticed that we have that we end up not necessarily having time for are about like better understanding the tools in which you're being used. So it might just be like yeah. looking at different facets of them. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, I'm writing that down. And I would co-sign, excuse me, I would co-sign with, you know, I know we're not doing this, but if we were taking a look at priority areas, that would be a top one for me. Yeah, no, I think looking at, um, holding ourselves accountable to those three points that Director Top read. Yeah. And uh, being clear about, you know, what that we don't have to wait for that top line data. What What is other data that's used to monitor these things? Yep. And can we get that on a different schedule? That makes a lot of sense. Yep. And okay. it doesn't even, and I just, again, want to drop home, I don't even necessarily need data. Like, I would love a presentation on, like, dibbles right, or whatever it is that we're using to like get a really clear, robust understanding, and if anything, like see some examples of students actually doing it with video and things like that. Um, I know that those add production costs or whatever, so there's probably an easier way to do it, but just as an example, it would be good to, you know, look under the hood a little bit. I think community would appreciate that as well. I think, um I would, I would actually not love a presentation on dimples. <laughs> what, I, what I would love is to understand, yeah, if, but, but relatedly, how that's being, how that's having an impact on student outcomes and if, if there are other strategies being used that are showing different results. Yeah, um, absolutely. How are, For sure. Yeah, yeah. For sure. All right. Um, okay, communication and collaboration. We rated ourselves as a one at this point, and as a board, um, it's just what's in the room. It's it's uh, um, it's about like adopting goals, tracking time use, setting goals. How it's it's a lot of how yeah. we use our time and work together. I think that that's improved beyond a one, at least in the last couple of months. But it hasn't if you. It's just a thought. I know. Um, mostly because of the uh, policy manual. So yep. in in uh, the green there for communication and collaboration, the board limits its adoption of board policies regarding school system operations to matters that are required by law or an appropriate exercise of the board's oversight authority as defined by the board's adopted goals and or guardrails. Um, that's the policy manual review yeah. that hasn't been completed. Um, so we could complete that um, with the, so, okay. I, this is also a question of capacity because also we can do as many of these things as we want if we have the time. <laughs> we don't have tons of time. So we still have um, ad hoc policy manual committee that was uh, temporarily not in action. I would like to re-engage it um, if people have capacity. That would be myself as chair and my thinking was appointing Director Top and Director Clark may or may not know this <laughs> to that committee 
uh, to make recommendations to the full board, basically to pick up where that committee left off and finish it off, um, which I, I mean, do any of us really have time? But I will make that. That is, this, uh, that is a priority of mine, and I think something that will help us move forward in a lot of different areas. Um, but if we don't have capacity for that, um, I think that I we think could. That's a lot. Just being honest. Yeah. Given everything that's going to be expected of us next semester. I honestly think that with mm, especially if you're a few meetings we could do it. it. It's just my two cents. I think you stay at a one for October, December, and then you could say the goal could be in the new year, January, that, March. I like that idea. I just don't think that it's good to pick up any additional work before we have whatever we're going to do with consolidation sorted in September or whenever we finalize that. It's just going to get lost and people are going to be stressed and the quality of the work is going to suffer. It is, although, and this will not be something that a ton of people want to hear, we've provided our direction about consolidation and we need to approve it and we need to get updates, but that is superintendent work. I totally get that. And the reality of the situation is that there's going to be a lot expected of board directors as well. So if you, again, my two cents, and it's worth about as much as you pay for it, right? <laughs> I think that you're going to get a higher quality of work if you wait. But you're the president, and I'm going to be happy with whatever you decide. Unity. Um, trust. What? I just said yeah. unity. Hey, did we just move to a one? I think, yeah, I think we just bumped up to a one Sick. with that comment. Yeah. <laughs> right on. Uh, I mean, so we all know I'm obsessed with the policy manual, but it's because it is our direction mm -hmm. codified. Mm -hmm. So I'm highly motivated to make that, to continue make that a priority. Um, I will reach out to directors Top and Clark and ask about um, capacity. capacity. Yeah. Make sure you get director top those dates so that she can. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and we did actually do previously do a lot of mm -hmm. the work to go into that. Yeah. Just kind of need to. I think it's doable. Button it up. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. That was which one was that? Communication collaboration. Okay. Unity and trust also related to the policy manual, so um, the adoption of board operating procedures, mm -hmm. um, which again I think is doable because again we have several drafts and work on that that has happened, um, but we need to have have that finalized and brought to the board for, for recommended action. I don't see how you get to July, in July, September, when we haven't set out as, uh, the work plan forward, the board reviews all policies go governing board operating procedures at least once during every length. Like, we won't have that set out, I don't think, by July, September. Um, oh, you're right. We probably won't have that calendared out. So we, that makes it so we. No, we probably won't. So I don't, I don't think you get to a one at least July, September. I think that post September, if we start calendaring that out, we could get, we could hit that one. But I don't think we would get there July, September. Okay. Are you, which one are you talking so, about? Uh, sorry, in Unity and Trust, approaching student outcomes, the one, the the one to third one down. The board reviews all policies governing board operating procedures at least once during every length of time equal to a board member's term of office. Mm -hmm. So that's setting that policy manual review calendar, okay, okay. Um, which we could, I mean, we could probably set it in about, but we would still, I think, we would still have yet to have the entire policy manual gone through with the evaluation tool from the policy committee, so we wouldn't have... Um, count them all out yet. 
Um, but I think we can make some meaningful progress towards that. Okay, that was, yeah, so maybe, uh, yeah, okay. And then the last one, continuous improvement. What's the action item that'll take us from zero to um, Oh, participating in a governance team training with all board members and the superintendent present. That we can do. We can do that in August. Yeah. See? <laughs> that makes sense. Okay. What takes us from a one to a two? Or what takes us from a one to a three in that is... I don't think we're going to get to three in January um, March. The board has hosted and board members have led or co-led at least one training session on governance. Which we actually, well, could end up doing it. Anyway. Um, That's everything, right? That's it. Okay. Anybody else have any questions or comments on any of that? I took notes. I'll write them back up again. Okay. So how did we? What are what are our new goals? What is this on? No. Oh, well. Um. <laughs> uh, thank you. So where? Wh what did we amend here? Um, let's see. Okay, so we, uh, should have a student needs assessment to inform creating the goals for the first one. But just like the numbers in the oh. columns. Well, no, the first numbers, they still are what right, they are. But for the projections. For the projections. Oh, okay. Um. I think it would go for the July, September from top to bottom. Do you have uh, I can give you what I yeah, sure, think we sure, talked yeah, about. I, sure. So for, I'm, I'm just going to go vision and goals. April through June, 25. July through September, 25. October through December, 35. January through March, 35. This is an area of focus. Okay. Values and guardrails. April through June, we're at a five. July through September, five. October through December, five. January through March, five. So that stays the same, but there are some accountability items that we want to focus on specifically through calendaring, making sure we're focusing on that and, and keep, keep, oh, sorry, that's the next one. That's the next one, yeah. Sorry. Monitoring and accountability, we stay at 10 across the board, but there are some focus areas besides that 25% first, first, um, tenant. Um, communication and collaboration, I have us at April through June, one. July through September, one. October through December, one through or five, depending on capacity from Director Clark and myself and Director Rankin. Um, January through March, five. Unity and trust, April through June, zero. July through September, zero. October through December, one. And this is where I don't think we hit three in January through March, but because I think there's some big leaps there. Yeah. Um, so stay at one. Stay for at one. January. Yep. March. Okay. Wait, that's for unity and trust. Yeah, that's what that's what we're talking about. But yeah. I, do you? Yeah. Do you disagree? We actually are already. Have yeah, I quite feel a like, few of the ones yeah. in column three. So yeah. I don't know that that's that big of a. I don't know that that's as big of a leap as. Yeah, I. It's the calendar of being able to review all policies. That might take a little bit more time. But we already have a lot of what's in the third column. Okay. Yeah. So three, then unity and trust January through March. I think so. At least that's what we should aim for. Mm -hmm. And then 
continuous improvement, April through June, zero, July through September, one, October through December, one. Do you think we can get to three January through March? I think it'd be a stretch. Yeah, I think you stay at one. So January through March, one. Okay. Are we, Liza, are you going to update this um, sheet with our new, our revised? Yeah, I was just going to ask. So, in some of this guidance, this is a question for staff. Um, you know, the best practice would be that we would adopt or we would, we would confirm with a vote the approval of our self evaluation. But I don't want to add an action item. <laughs> Uh, so, how can this be recorded into the record? The record. I mean, we is is there a function on staff's end? Because if it just needs to be recorded into the record, it's here, and then we can vote on it when we get back in September. I mean, it's here. I just want it to be documented. I guess show up and it's on YouTube. Minutes. I'm just messing with you. Um, I mean, I think it has to at this point, right? Because somebody cut my mic. Oh. I guess so. Let's see. Well, this is something to think about for the next cycle of like, do we actually make that part of action items or something? Um, but I could amend this and bring it back in in August. Yeah. And on consent agenda so that would yeah. just be there and if if people if if I misremembered or if we have questions or something we can pull it and talk about it again otherwise it'll be there in the meeting I think that's great okay and I have one more request um, in the newly cleaned board office thank you for all the work that went into that <laughs> uh, if we could get this like printed on a 24 by 36 page maybe laminated so that we can see progress over time because if I'm not looking at this I'm not gonna be that's thinking a great about idea. it Teacher. To have that in front of us. Yeah. <laughs> I second that non motion. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. I think. Unless unless anybody's got anything for the good of the order. There is no further business to become before the board, so the regular board meeting is now adjourned at 6, 11 p.m. Thank you, everybody. Did you say the board is adjourned? I did. It's Happy adjourned. 4th of July. Wow. What a miracle. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Happy holidays. <laughs>